I guess I can work with that. Um, so I'm, I'm pleased to have this opportunity to talk to you today with, uh, about my work with Bob Siegler, developing a unified model of arithmetic. And I want to motivate this work uh, with a question, which is whether arithmetic is one skill or, or many. It's often treated as one skill in uh, larger scale assessments of uh, mathematical uh, competence and development. Um, and it seems simple when you define it as just processes of, of combining numbers with other num numbers to, to generate yet other numbers using the, the four basic operations of addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Mm, but this apparent simplicity actually belies the, the true complexity of arithmetic, um, which is apparent when you consider uh, applying these different operations to different types of numbers. So imagine how a child might solve arithmetic problems with the, the various types of numbers that I show here. Uh, in early development, children learn to add and uh, then subtract small digi uh, single digit whole numbers first uh, using counting based procedures um, and later using fact retrieval from memory. Uh, but neither of those methods is applied for any other type of number. No one can retrieve 246 plus 41 from memory. Uh, children learn uh, formal symbol manipulation algorithms, column arithmetic procedures, uh, and long division for doing arithmetic with uh, multi-digit whole numbers. Now those procedures are, are repurposed uh, when decimal arithmetic comes along, but children to do arithmetic with decimals need to also learn new procedures for dealing with the, uh, the decimal point. And then when fraction arithmetic comes along, they have to learn yet another set of entirely different procedures for that. Um, so I can kind of answer my initial question right away. It seems to me that arithmetic is many skills, not one. Uh, and so this uh, observation you know, suggests a challenge. Is it, is it possible to explain uh, arithmetic development, including all of these different types of numbers within a single theoretical framework? And that's the goal of, of the work. Um, that I'm talking about today. Uh, so together with, with Bob, we've developed and are now testing uh, UMA, a unified model of arithmetic. Now this is both a theory and a computational model. Uh, I want to start with uh, the theory in qualitative terms and then I'll talk about the computational model. And to describe the theory, I want to focus on how it answers three uh, fundamental questions about arithmetic development, which are shown here. Uh, so first, uh, where do children's errors come from? You know, many uh, models of arithmetic just focus on error rates, but we're very interested in the specific errors that children produce. And why do they say this instead of that when they don't get the, the right answer? And our model pr uh, proposes that the primary source of incorrect answers is correct procedures. That is, children err not by doing something totally off the wall or idiosyncratic, but by making some small and kind of predictable deviations from basically correct procedures. And we pr propose that these deviations mostly fall into two types, which we call overgeneralization and omission. Second, why are some problems harder than others? Well, most previous theories of arithmetic have focused on variations between problems in their intrinsic difficulty. So they try to use the features of the problems themselves to explain why some problems are harder and others are easier. Our theory acknowledges that variation in intrinsic difficulty does play a role, but unlike most other theories, we also believe that the input to learning makes a difference. The, the uh, relative frequencies of different types of problems uh, in the practice that children receive is, is uh, required to fully explain variations between problems in terms of error rates or accuracy. And finally, what causes individual differences in strategy use? Although children often display apparently discrete differences in the patterns of strategies they use, we propose that these apparently discrete differences actually reflect underlying continuous variation in the parameters that govern learning and decision making. So now I want to uh, talk about the computational model in which I'll make those, those theoretical claims a little more concrete. Uh, I won't have time to go into the model in too much technical detail, but at a very high level, uh, the model itself is the part of this picture that's in blue and gray color in the middle. The green and white on the left and right are the inputs and outputs. Uh, the way the model works is to, to simulate the process of a child solving an arithmetic problem. You present the model with a problem that's entered into the model's workspace. Um, it then will iteratively select and execute production rules which operate on the workspace, changing its contents, 
until eventually an answer is received. Uh, if the model is in learning mode, it can simulate the process of learning from practice, and so it receives feedback, which uh, you know, I don't uh, model the full complexity of different types of feedback that we've just heard about. My feedback is just a zero or one that was correct or not, and based on that feedback, the model's learning algorithm will modify the contents of its long-term memory, thus affecting the probability of, of choosing similar procedures in the future to those that it used in the present learning episode. So how does this model implement the theoretical assumptions? Well, first, just a little more detail on the, the model's long-term memory, specifically its procedure memory. So this is a production system model in the uh, tradition of, of ACTAR, although it is not an ACTAR model. And so the procedure memory consists of what are called production rules, uh, which is a formalism for, for modeling uh, procedural knowledge. Uh, production rule is a, a condition action pair where the condition says under what conditions can you use this rule and the action says if you use this rule what should you do. Um, so these uh, production rules are written so as to represent uh, correct arithmetic procedures just like the ones you'll find in a math textbook but there are also production rules representing errors that children might commit and these are called mal rules. And these mal rules were created, you know, hand created by me, the, the programmer, but following uh, two mechanisms, which are overgeneralization and omission. So to apply overgeneralization, I basically take a correct rule and I delete part of its condition. And by deleting that condition, it allows the production rule to be applied in a wider variety of situations than appropriate. It can be in particular used in situations for which it's not appropriate, thus producing an error. Now, omission also involves deletion. In this case, it's deletion of part of the action part of a rule. So uh, uh, omission essentially means taking a, a production rule and not doing everything that you're supposed to do when you use that rule, but doing only part of it. Okay, so these uh, uh, production rules in, uh, created by overgeneralization and omission implement the theoretical assumption about the origins of errors. So secondly, um, the uh, assumption about the um, sources of, of variation between problems in terms of their difficulty is implemented by the model's learning algorithm. So this learning algorithm, uh, what it does is basically every time the, the model um, does a problem and receives feedback, uh, it will adjust the associations uh, that are stored in long-term memory between the features of the problem and the production rules that were used while solving the problem. And over time, this mechanism will cause the model to tend to prefer production rules that have generated correct answers in the past. So that's how the model learns. And because this learning process is uh, it's tied to the features of the problems. And so uh, the preference for correct procedures will be stronger for problems that have features that have frequently appeared in the past compared to those that have rarely appeared in the past. And so the model is going to tend to do better on types of problems that it sees a lot compared to problems that it sees rarely. And so this mechanism implements the second theoretical assumption that the distribution of input should affect the difficulty of problems. Finally, the third assumption had to do with individual differences in strategy use and the uh, effects of parametric variation on, on such differences. So uh, I can't really dive into the technical details due to time constraints, but the, the two gray parts of the model, which are kind of its executive processes, they're each governed by one of the model's free parameters. Um, there are a few other free parameters that I won't mention, but I'll focus on two. So one of these is called G or decision determinism. Uh, this parameter governs how strongly the model prefers production rules that have received greater reinforcement in the past. Um, so you can look at this parameter in, in two ways. In one way, it sort of governs the, the strength of, of the effect of past experience on present decisions. Uh, it's kind of like a learning rate parameter. Um, but it also sort of is the capacity for consistency. The larger the, the value of this parameter, the more consistent or deterministic the model will be. The lower its value, the more random the model will be. The second uh, parameter I want to emphasize is, is D or error discount. This parameter governs how much less reinforcement is given to production rules that have generated incorrect answers as compared to correct answers. So if D has a high value, the model will penalize production rules that generate errors more. And if it has a low value, it will penalize them less or even not at all. Uh, so the claim is that variation of these parameters will lead to discrete differences in strategy use, and that's something I'll have to demonstrate in my simulations, which I will uh, talk about now. 
So the goal of the, uh, the uh, study I'm going to present is to test this model in, in a new domain. Um, this is actually a generalization of an earlier model, FERA, which uh, we created and tested in the domain of fraction arithmetic. Uh, so what I want to do today is um, to test the, the more general model, UMA, which I've, I've just described, which simulates not only fraction arithmetic, but also arithmetic with whole numbers and decimals. And in this presentation, I'm going to focus on decimals. So we're going to evaluate the ability of the model to simulate children's uh, performance in decimal arithmetic. And to do so, we created uh, 1,000 instances of the model by systematically varying its free parameters. So we can view these as 1,000 simulated students. And each of them was trained on a learning set um, and then tested on a test set. And the learning set, uh, I think, is, is pretty realistic in terms of uh, you know, training of computational models. Uh, we simply extracted all of the decimal arithmetic practice problems from a commercial math textbook series, Go Math, from grades 1 to grade 6, and we fed them into the model in order. Um, the model was tested on a set of decimal arithmetic problems that we'd previously given to 6th and 8th grade uh, children in a previous empirical study, so we could compare the model's performance on the problems to that of children on the same problems. And these were the problems. So you can see that uh, there's a total of 12 problems, including addition and multiplication. Um, they included uh, two types of operand pairs, uh, that is two decimals, or DD, and one whole number and one decimal, or WD. All right, so I'm going to jump right into the results, and I'll start with the types of errors committed, as that one of the major theoretical claims of the model is that it should explain uh, where children's errors come from. So we want to see, can the model generate errors similar to those of children? Well, uh, the model generated 61% of the errors committed by children, and in particular, it generated the most common error uh, committed by children on all 12 of the problems in the test set. And I'll just show some examples here. So one of the addition problems was 2.46 plus 4.1. We can see in the top row, 6.56 marked with the asterisk is, that, is the correct answer. And that was generated most often, both by children in the third column and by the model in the fourth column. Uh, the two most common errors were 0 0.287 and 2.87. Both of these errors result from misaligning the add-ins so that you, uh, you align them by the rightmost digit instead of by the decimal point. Um, and these errors were both generated by children and both generated by uh, the model. Uh, the second example is 2.4 times 1.2. Again, the most uh, common answer was the correct one, 2.88. Um, but the next four most common responses, all incorrect, that were generated by children were 28.8, 7.2, 2.8, and 0 0.72. And all except 2.8 were also generated by the model. All right, so the model does a pretty good job of generating children's more common errors. And uh, how does the model explain those errors? Um, well, it explains them by saying these are all a consequence of either overgeneralization or omission. So let's see how that plays out concretely starting with overgeneralization. So this is an example from children's written work uh, for the problem 2.4 times 1.2. We can see what the child has done here is mostly correct. They've multiplied the, the 2 in 1.2 by the 2.4 to get 4.8, then multiplied the 1 by the 2.4 to get uh, 24, which they have correctly shifted one column to the left. Um, to reflect the, the greater place value of the, of the multiplicand, and then they've added the digits in those so-called partial products correctly to get 288. The only thing they've done wrong is the placement of the decimal point in that answer, which they have placed in the way that you would do if this were an addition problem. Okay, They've draw, uh, dragged the decimal point straight down from the ad, uh, operands into the answer. And so um, we can see this error results from taking something that would be correct for one operation and using it on another operation. That's exactly what we refer to as overgeneralization, and that is indeed how the model generates that same answer. As for omission, here's an example taking, taken from a different child's work on the same problem. Here we can see what the child has done wrong is uh, they failed to shift that second partial product, the 2, 4, uh, to the left by one column, as they should do. And uh, the model uh, explains that as an instance of omission in the sense that you've simply failed to do one of the steps of the correct procedure, which is to, to do that shift. 
And in fact, these two uh, types of errors can be compounded, as in this work from yet another child on the same problem, where they have both uh, overgeneralized in terms of placing the decimal point in the manner you would do for addition, but also omitted by failing to left shift that second partial product. So we can see that these two basic error generating mechanisms, they sound simple, but they're actually very productive and powerful in terms of the range of errors that they can explain. Okay. So uh, the second big issue I wanted to discuss was variation in difficulty between different problems. So I'm showing here children's data. These are error rates, percent errors on addition and multiplication problems um, for uh, problems involving two decimal operands or DD, those, those are the blue bars, or a whole number in a decimal operand, uh, those are the green bars. So we can see a, an interesting interaction here where the presence of a whole number operand uh, increases errors for addition, but decreases errors for multiplication. The model produces the same interaction. So that's nice. We'd like to know why does it produce that interaction. And I've said that the theoretical claim is that uh, difficulty depends on the distribution of input. So in order to know why the model produces this pattern, we have to look at the input that it receives. So this is the input. These are the distributions of uh, the percentages of different types of decimal arithmetic problems in math textbooks. And I think it should just jump right out at you that there's one type of problem that's extremely rare, which are addition and subtraction problems involving a whole number operand. Those problems are hard for the model, and we assume also hard for children because they never see such problems. There's nothing intrinsically harder about them, in other words. Okay, so the third major theoretical claim had to do with individual differences in strategy use. Um, I'm sort of compacting a lot of history into a short time here. We had an expectation that we would see specific patterns in children's decimal arithmetic strategies because we had previously observed these patterns in children's fraction arithmetic. So these patterns were predicted before our empirical study a priori based on the, the fraction arithmetic findings. And the, the patterns we expected to see were as follows, correct strategies, which is defined as using a correct strategy on at least three quarters of the problems in the set. Addition and subtraction perseveration, which is uh, defined as using an addition subtraction strategy on at least three quarters of the problems in the set, which means you mostly get addition problems correct, but you mostly get multiplication problems incorrect in this case. By the way, I say addition slash subtraction because it's the same strategy. Our, our test set actually only has addition, but the strategy is an addition subtraction strategy. Third is multiplication perseveration, which is basically the opposite. It means you use a strategy that would be appropriate for multiplication on most of the problems in the set, resulting in correct answers on multiplication problems and errors on addition problems. And finally, variable strategies, which involves using, uh, showing no consistent pattern, but using uh, a diversity of strategies, both on addition problems and on multiplication problems. So we expected to find all four of these patterns in children's data, and we did find them. These are the proportions of children that displayed each of the four patterns. So we uh, simply classified our simulated students using the exact same operational definitions, and we wanted to see, does the model also generate these four patterns? And it does. Uh, so these are the proportions of instances of the model that displayed each, each pattern. Um, and uh, the ranking is not identical, nor are the absolute percentages, but they are rather similar in that correct strategies is the most common pattern and multiplication perseveration the least common, uh, both in children's and the model's data. So how does the model explain these variations in strategy use? Well, the theoretical claim was that these differences emerge from uh, differences in the underlying parameters, uh, the decision determinism and error discount. So we looked at the average values of these parameters among the instances of the model that generated each of the four uh, patterns of strategy use. So correct strategies we found emerged in the model when that first parameter, the decision determinism, had a, a, a medium high or high value. 0.06 is, is medium high within the range of values that we tested, um, as well as a, a medium high or high value of the error discount parameter. So in qualitative terms, what that means is that the model displays uh, consistent correct behavior when it has a capacity for consistency that comes from the first, the decision determinism parameter, but it also has the capacity to self-correct, to correct errors uh, and get out of entrenched incorrect patterns, which is uh, coming from that second parameter, the high value of error discount. Now, when we have the first of those criteria, the capacity for consistency, but not the second, 
in other words, no ability to self-correct, what, what might we expect a child with those characteristics to do? Okay, children are uh, taught to add and subtract decimals before they are taught to multiply decimals. Okay, so the early entry strategy is the addition strategy. So children with this, these characteristics, high decision determinism, but low error discount, they should learn that addition strategy well, but fail to unlearn it on multiplication problems. In other words, they continue using it even when it's no longer correct. Okay, so those are indeed the parameter values that give rise to that strategy pattern in the model. A high decision determinism, but low error discount. I'll just skip over multiplication perseveration because that was a quite rare pattern, but we can see the variable strategies pattern emerges when we have a low value of decision determinism, which basically means that your experience has only a weak influence on your present decisions, and your decisions are therefore rather random. Uh, so you can't exhibit any consistent pattern, either a correct or an incorrect one. All right, so uh, I'm going to sum up now um, the success of this model in simulating children's decimal arithmetic using an architecture that we originally created to model fraction arithmetic argues in our view for the generality of the central uh, theoretical assumptions underlying that model, which just as a reminder were that most errors represent small deviations from correct procedures via either overgeneralization or omission. The variations in error rates across problems reflect not only intrinsic difficulty, but also the effects of the distribution of input to learning. And finally, that differences in uh, strategy use reflect underlying continuous variation in learning parameters. So the viability of this as a truly unified model of arithmetic obviously also depends on its ability to explain whole number arithmetic as well as fractions and decimals. And that's something we're engaged in testing right now. And I hope I'll have a chance to uh, talk to you about it in the future. So I want to thank uh, my collaborator, Bob Siegler, the NSF for uh, funding this research, and, and you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you.